Hey YouTube, it is, uh, well, what is it? It's February the 20th, which makes it a Sunday, 2022. Welcome to the Bubba Continuum. I'm thinking of changing the name of the channel again, uh, partly so people won't think my name is Bubba. But anyway, welcome back. I thought I'd put up another video. It's been a while since I did, uh, did a video. The last one I did was our fourth, my, when I say our, I mean my wife and I, our fourth call for prayer requests, and that's what this is. If you'd like any type of prayer for your problems, I, I, please say something in the comments and we'll pray for you. As I always say, you know, try, try to make sure it's not something stupid. Don't ask us to pray for God to tell you who, which horse is going to win at the track, you know, stuff like that. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, the usual things. Getting closer to God, being filled with the Holy Spirit, um, family problems, barrenness, marriage issues, uh, children you want to have God grab by the scruff of the neck and, you know, bring back into the fold, stuff like that, illnesses, whatever, please give us your request because there's nothing better for us to do here on earth, you know. There's no greater purpose we can serve as far as I know. We would like to pray for you. So, uh, well, I guess I should tell you, we, we the last person who gave us a request that I know of, uh, the last person who comment I saw was a guy named Armando, and he prayed for help with he, he wanted help from God with starting some kind of ministry so we prayed for God to teach him and help him and help him to be ready for a wife and help a wife to come together with him and so forth and fill him with revelation and and good doctrine and so forth you know you name it we prayed for it um, <clears throat> and of course we also prayed for a lady named Sheila she prayed for some relatives that she wanted to she wanted them to receive salvation, and she gave a good testimony. She said one of them had gone out and bought a Bible and was showing more interest in God all of a sudden. So um, it was very gratifying. I hope we can. I hope you'll put up requests, and we'll come back with your testimony. So that's all. You, if that's all you care about is you know the prayer thing, you know you can turn off the video now because I'm going to go into things that have happened in my life and my wife's life recently. It's important to testify. The the Bible says that. Uh, God's children, you know, in the Revelation, I think it is, overcome by the blood of the Lamb and their testimony. And it doesn't say by teaching they receive by watching TBN. It says by their testimony, your personal experience. And Christianity is supposed to be a personal experience. You, When you testify, you have authority because you're talking about things you know to be true. You experience them personally. Uh, the Bible says we are witnesses. It says we are all witnesses. And only a witness can give testimony in court. You can't just show up in court and say, well, I heard this and I heard that. Or I heard this guy say that you have to be you have to have personal knowledge in order to be a witness. So there's a reason the Bible calls us witnesses. A witness is, is uh, compelling, a persuasive. Uh, anyway, it's important to share testimony. Um, just a couple of little things. Like I received a miracle healing two days ago. Three days ago, I made pizza which wasn't too good. I deviated from my recipe. But anyway, I made pizza, burned myself uh, in the oven, which isn't a big deal. It was a tiny little burn. I didn't care. You know, once you get old, you don't really, little bumps and bruises don't mean much to you. But the next day I woke up and I was in prayer and I kept, I kept being distracted. I didn't know what was distracting me. And finally I realized I was feeling pain from my hand. And I realized it was, it was pain from this tiny little burn. It was just uh, bugging me. So I thought I would pray and uh, asked God to heal me. So I prayed and asked God to heal me, and I included God's other children. You know, if they had burns or injuries, you know, wherever they were, for God to reach out and heal them too, and so forth, and to motivate other people to pray for them and to glorify himself and to show that he had done this so people wouldn't say, well, you know, so they know it, it, it had happened, so they know he was responsible. It wasn't just some fluke. Uh, prayed a little while longer and, you know, stopped thinking about the burn. And then I realized after a while that I didn't feel anything anymore. So I started looking at my hand and it's gone. There's no trace of the burn. There's no pain. There's no spot. Can't find it. Can't even remember where it was. I know it was on one of my fingers uh, on my right hand, but I can't, you know, I mean, I've only got four fingers on my right hand. So uh, I looked at them all, you know, and it's not there. So that was kind of remarkable. And sometimes I feel bad because all, all the miracle I've received miracle healings from burns a lot. And I, feel, I have had other miraculous healings. Um, and sometimes I feel bad because the, the, I've said this before, because the things that I've been healed of miraculously have been so trivial, you know. Um, blisters and things like, look, if you blister your finger touching something hot, um, it's not dramatic when you tell people about it. But, you know, 
people need to wake up. It's stupid to think that a, a small miracle isn't important. I mean, it's extremely important. It, what happened to me was impossible. It was physically impossible. One minute I was burned, and a few minutes later I was not burned. You know, so the damage was gone, and I couldn't find it. Um, if you think that's a small thing, you know, you know, you, do, you need to remember that all over the world there are scientists experimenting with very small things and making gigantic discoveries that are extremely important. You can get a the Nobel Prize working on something tiny. Uh, I used to work for when I was, I was getting my physics degree. I studied with. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I worked as a lab assistant for a guy named Yakov Chevy, and his, his thing was um, using lasers to cool tiny, to, to cool, um, I believe it was either atoms or molecules. Anyway, it was gas. It, motion in gases is, I mean, uh, temperature in gases is actually, you know, expressed in movement. So you, if you take a laser and you direct it at a, an atom of a gas and you've managed to make it stop moving, then even though you're shooting a laser at it, you've, you've cooled it. That was how it worked. It was pretty weird. Um, anyway, that was his thing. He, he was working on little tiny bits of, of gases and it was important. It was very important. So it, it's, uh, if you're not a believer, you know, it, it's, it's really inconsistent for you to say that science is wonderful and scientific discoveries are wonderful and they're very important and great. But if I get healed of a small thing on my finger, it's not great. It is great. It's a huge thing. So uh, that was wonderful. And also, you know, what if I had had a big burn? What if I, what if I fell into the barbecue or something? I mean, I'd, I'd be pretty grateful. I mean, if God can heal one, he can heal the other. So that's one nice thing that happened. And, um, of course, my wife always has some kind of testimony. She knows this guy in Zambia where she lives, and he's had these problems with these two women in his life. Actually, there's three. He has a girlfriend and a girlfriend, the girlfriend's younger sister and the girlfriend's mother who lives in the Congo. And the Congo is even more full of witchcraft than Zambia. So she had had these weird visions about uh, these three women, and it was revealed to her that the youngest one was a witch and the mother was a witch, and uh, she called this guy and said, she had seen these things in her dreams, how they were battling with each other. And he said, you know, you're crazy, nice Christian girl. And then later on, he put a video on Facebook casting demons out of this girl, the young sister. Uh, and he admitted that she was a witch and that my wife was right all along. And then uh, recently she had a dream where, where she was at this guy's house and she saw this guy having sex with his girlfriend, which, and he this guy's he wants to be a preacher. He's trying to start a church. And here he is having sex with his girlfriend in this dream. And in the dream, there was some other observer there. There was some guy in the house, some stranger watching. I have no idea what that was, a spirit or something. So um, she calls him up and says, I've had this vision. You know, you've been sleeping with this woman because he's not married yet. It's bad. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have two women in his house that he's not married to. I mean, he shouldn't have his girlfriend in the house and he definitely shouldn't have the girlfriend's witch uh, sister in the house, but he did, which is bad, a terrible move. So she calls him up and says she's had this dream, and then he admits that he's been fornicating. I mean, he doesn't say I've been fornicating. What he says is, well, a preacher came to my house, and he told us he did something or other and said essentially that they were married in the eyes of God, and it was okay to go ahead and have sex, which is not true. I mean, you need to have some kind of legal document. That's just, you know, if you haven't, if you don't have something legal, um, you don't have a marriage. A marriage isn't, isn't just uh, a, re a religious thing. You know, it's not just a thing of God, but it's also a, a civil matter. So, uh, I mean, my wife and I, when we got married, we weren't able to get together in person without a lot of tremendous difficulty. So we got married over the internet, which is legal. And uh, we got a civil marriage in Provo, Utah. And it, it's binding. And after that, we were clear to go. You know, anything we wanted to do <clears throat> in private, that was cool. Um, so, uh, this guy's not married. He's not married. And he was, he was relying on this crazy argument that he was married in the eyes of God. So that's really interesting. <laughs> he apparently can't get away with anything because whatever he tries to do, God's going to give my wife a dream. And I told her she ought to uh, stop calling him about this stuff. I, even, even if God has given him this, inf this, her, her this information, you know, uh, this guy's a man and I, my wife is married and he shouldn't be bought, he shouldn't be receiving counsel from somebody else's wife. Somebody else should be doing that job. Um, I don't. I don't believe married. I don't believe married women should be running around talking to other men, e even when they're trying to be helpful. I think that you know, when when there's a, a husband in the house, he should be the one who who represents you to other men. 
And in the same vein, I don't think I should be running around talking to women. You know, if, if there's a problem with a woman in my life, then my wife should go deal with it. So uh, anyway, that's our, that's our testimony. These things have been happening, and it's, it's really neat. Um, and I, we got some revelation. I, I wish I could remember all the details. I wrote it down on my blog, and I can't remember all about it. But basically, God showed me that... Um, it's very important to it's very important to pray for others when you pray. So if you, you remember, I set up when I, I got this burn and I, when I prayed for healing, I prayed not just that I would be healed, but that God's other children would be healed if they had this problem. And the reason I did that was because I had had this revelation. Um, I realized that when we pray, we we need to pray for God's other children. And I got this on my own from God, and then I also got confirmation from some. Preacher, some preachers, some videos on YouTube, and and my wife got confirmation in a, a vision or a dream or something, and it all made sense. Um, there's a messianic rabbi named Zeb Porat, and he put a video up, and he was talking about the Lord's Prayer, and he he mentioned the fact that the Jesus used the plural, he used plural pronouns in the Lord's Prayer. He said, "Forgive us our trespasses," you know. Um, he, he said, "As we forgive those who sin against us." So uh, there's a reason for that. Jesus didn't, you know, we know from the Bible that Jesus went off and prayed and, and he would yell and, you know, make a lot of noise. He was very uh, active when he prayed. And he, was, he wasn't out there saying, oh, God, you know, give me gold, give me concubines. I, uh, I'd like really nice shoes so everybody else will be impressed when I wear them. He was praying for us. He was praying for people who, who were to come. He was praying for people who were alive at that time. So he wasn't just praying for himself. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense that, that God would, that it's better to, it's better to pray for more than one person for, for everyone because it makes more sense for God to listen to you when he has more at stake because God is very concerned about his children and we are the caretakers of this planet. I think I, I maybe I mentioned this in my last video. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it won't kill you to hear it again. Um, we all, we're, we're, we're human beings are the caretakers of, of the earth, and the reason there's evil in the world is that we don't do our job. So uh, it's important to remember that when we say we're the caretakers of the earth, we don't mean the actual ball of dirt, which is the earth. We mean the, the, the people. We're the caretakers of the people. We have a responsibility to the unsaved, even to those that are going to hell, who can't possibly be saved. We have a responsibility to be nice to them and you know pray that their suffering will be minimized and so forth. And we certainly have a, res a, a responsibility to um, our brothers and sisters in Christ because they literally are our brothers and sisters. It's not just an expression. If you have an unsaved brother by blood, and uh, then you have brothers in Christ that are strangers, maybe that you've never met, when you're in heaven a trillion years from now, your blood brother's not going to be there, and you're, never, you're not going to know that he ever existed. But you will be there with your father, your true father, and you will be there with your brothers in Christ. They are your real brothers. So uh, we should be praying for people. And he also helped me to understand that it's very important to intercede for really obnoxious, nasty people. And of course, he said this. He said, pray for those that use you despitefully and so forth. And uh, you, you might think it's because you just want to be a really nice person and be unselfish and so forth. But there's more to it than that. It's, it, it enhances your faith. When you pray for somebody you really like or you pray for yourself, it's not. It's, it's somewhat harder to have faith because those prayers are obviously a little bit selfish. But when you pray for somebody who's treated you badly or who's treated someone else badly, someone really awful, you uh, you know that's an unselfish prayer. You know it's God's will and not your will. And it's easier to have faith for something when you know it's God's will. So it works better. It actually works better. And that'll bleed over into prayers that you pray for people that you that you like. I mean, the increase in the help with your faith, that's going to bleed over when you pray for people you like. It's, so it's not just going to help, you know, um, Kim Jong-un or some other, you know, awful person that you can't stand that you prayed for. And, of course, it is good that, that you pray for people. It's good for the people that you pray for that are nasty and obnoxious because they do need it. And some of them will come around, you know, some of them will, be, will come around. And if no one prays for them, you can't expect God to just reach down on his own and, and do all this stuff because it's our job to pray for them. It's our, our job to ask him 
You know, sometimes he reaches down and does things and you can't understand why, and it seems like nobody prayed for it. Uh, but uh, generally, you know, he's, really, he's expecting us to do that. We're supposed to stand in the gap and be his watchman. So I would advise you, do what, I, do what I've been doing. And I, late at, in the evening, what I've been doing, um, I've been, I'll just lie down and try to think of the most nasty people I, I can, the, the most horrific, offensive people, um, and pray. And I'll pray for them for a long time, very sincerely. And when you do this, you know, and you forgive them and you, you, you say, you know, they're not that bad, God. They're all right. They're no worse than I am. Love starts to flow through you. And that will take you to 1 John 4.18, and for, which I'll paraphrase. It says, uh, perfect love, which means, perfect means complete, you know, perfect. That's what the word actually means. Completed love casts out fear. And it says, it also says, if you have fear in you, then love isn't complete in you. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a slap in the face. That's an important thing to realize that you were supposed to love God, um, that's the first commandment. It's it, before obeying him, before believing him, you know, we're supposed to love God. That's number one on the list. That's, that's number one in the Old Testament, and it's number one according to Jesus. So um, this will help you to get love flowing, God's love flowing in you. And uh, it'll if you're anxious, if you're worried, you know, if the future scares you, it may be because you're not interceding enough. As crazy as that sounds, it may be because you're not interceding for your enemies. So I recommend you try it. Give it a try. See what happens. I'm trying to think if there's anything else to tell you. Uh, sorry if I look stranger than usual. I got out of the shower. My hair's still wet. Um, oh, also, uh, I really, really just about quit. I, my wife and I have both given up social media, no Facebook, no Instagram, none of that stuff. The only thing I have left is YouTube. And, and when, I start, when I start thinking that doesn't serve a purpose, I'm going to quit that. Um, but I've also done things like I've given up watching fiction, movies, you know, I don't care. People say, oh, it's a Christian movie. I don't care. I'm not watching it. Um, I haven't seen news in days. A little, you know, incidentally, just accidentally someone will tell me about the news or maybe I'll, I'll see something accidentally on the internet. But other than that, I have no idea what's happening in the world. Um, I, I don't watch any type of entertainment. You know, I, I'll go on YouTube and I'll watch interview. I'll watch videos about tools or science sometimes. Stuff, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I won't watch fiction anymore. I got this big revelation about the, the symmetry of the supernatural. Something I always talk about. Whatever God has, Satan has some kind of a copy. And whatever Satan has, you better look for for whatever it is that he copied, because uh, there are things that we've forgotten that God has for us. And uh, it's very obvious that Satan's copies are very obvious, but the, the things that God had has for us are not that obvious because the church has forgotten about them. But if you look at Satan's kingdom, you, you, you know, you'll see, gee, there's something, we should have something like that. And sure enough, it, you'll find out it's out there. You'll see it in the Bible or something. So uh, I thought about the symmetry of the supernatural, and I thought about the fact that we're supposed to have living water go through us all the time. We're supposed to pray in tongues. We're supposed to hear the word of wisdom you know, the, the word of knowledge, all sorts of stuff is supposed to flow through us, peace, love, joy, correction. And when you pray in tongues, this is what happens. Well, that's supposed to sanctify you and improve you, but Paul said it builds you up. Okay, well, by the symmetry of the supernatural, there's also a water of death. There's not just living water, there's the water of death. And what is the water of death? Well, it comes from Satan. It comes from his, his filthy throne. Uh, it's, it's funny because my wife once had a vision of Satan. You know, she saw this vision. She saw Satan sitting before her on a throne made of gold and excrement, big lumps of excrement were raining on him. And he, it had been happening to him for so long, he was completely used to it. You know, a big thing would hit him in the face. And, it, you know, it didn't, just meant nothing to him because it was just the way he lived. Um, so you can, the water, the living water comes from God's throne. If you read the Bible, you'll see that. So it would make sense that, that Satan would have a throne and, and that the water of death would come from him, the black water. Um, I, I realized I was fighting with God. I, on the one hand, I was praying in tongues and saying, help me with this and help me with that. You know, help me not to lust, help me not to be a glutton, help me not to be lazy, angry, whatever it is. I was doing that, and then I was watching this garbage that comes from Hollywood. And I'd say, well, this is pretty safe. You know, there's nobody being killed. There's no nudity in it. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Whenever you look at a Hollywood movie, almost always, either you're seeing a distorted Christian movie, so it totally distorts the way that Christianity works, which is not good, or you'll see, uh, generally movies are about a fictional universe in which there is no God. 
when the, when the characters get in trouble, you don't see him calling out to God. You don't see him saying, oh, I need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because in Hollywood, they know that if they put that, if they put that stuff in a movie, uh, number one, no one's going to watch it. And number two, the people who work in it know that they'll never work again. You know, that's how you get blackballed in Hollywood. Hollywood is, is uh, it, it, it just parrots whatever Satan says from his throne. And I, I, I learned a lot about this stuff. I, I, I had forgotten how filthy Hollywood is. The people in Hollywood are really filthy people. They are really disgusting. And this is not something new. This is historically for thousands of years, you know, um, actors have been filthy, disgusting people. Entertainers have been revolting people, you know, in the Middle Ages. or in, Well, not even not even just in the Middle Ages, but, you know, ever, ever for centuries and centuries. Uh, when actors came into town, people would uh, tar, tar them and feather them and run them out of town. I mean, they, they would lock their doors. But they knew that when actors came into town, girls would get pregnant, uh, things would get stolen, because they were just low-grade people, and that's still true. You look at Hollywood now. Look at the, look at how the people live. They're 100% carnal. They're they're narcissists. They crave admiration. Um, they're you know they all go to rehab. They all marry and remarry. They fornicate like crazy. They hate God. Um, and a lot of the people we think of as heterosexual in Hollywood are 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 gays and lesbians, and that's always been true. There's a and God showed me something last week. There's this guy named Scotty Bowers, and you can his name spelled just the way I pronounced it. And uh, he died uh, like a year or two ago, something like that. He died when he was a, around 99 years of age. This guy was a Marine in World War II. He was a paratrooper, and he he fought supposedly. He fought in Guadalcanal and Okinawa, and he was a, a masculine guy, you know, a good-looking guy, not effeminate at all. And he was a nice person. He was warm. He was good to his friends. Everybody, everybody speaks very highly of him. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, he was a, a gay pimp. He got a job at an arco station in Los Angeles. And when he got back from the war, and an, an actor named Walter Pigeon, who's you know supposedly heterosexual, pulled in one day and started talking about how cute he was. And he got in Walter Pigeon's car, went to his house, and and they sodomized each other. I, actually, I don't know who sodomized who, but that's what they did. And after that, this guy, the gas station became a center, um, a net, sort of a networking center for various types of perverts. And Gore Vidal would go there. Um, Rock Hudson, he, Rock Hudson worked as a male prostitute before he became rich. Um, oh, geez, so many people. Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. He he was a closeted homosexual. And she was a lesbian. And this guy said that over the course of her life, that he fixed her up with at least 150 women. Um, Huge numbers of people. He added them once they were gone, because he figured it couldn't hurt them. And he thought, you know, he's not he's not ashamed of anything. He's not ashamed of me. He, this guy is he's homosexual. He says he's had sex with men. He's had sex with women. He's had sex with children. He's had sex with animals, and he's not ashamed of any of it. He says he said that when he was 11 years old, he was introduced to the priest. He, his family moved into a house, and across the street there was a Catholic church, and he was introduced to the priest. And he sensed a connection between them, and he started providing sexual services to the priest for money, and the priest started passing them around to other priests. And and when you ask this guy about when he, this guy was asked about this later in his life, how bad he felt about being damaged and taken advantage of, he said that was ridiculous. It was all his idea. He he wasn't damaged at all. He thought it was great. And he said that when he was 11, he used to find girls for a, a, his teacher, like a fifth grade teacher. Who was a lesbian so this guy was just out there sexually but on the other hand he was a really nice person and apparently didn't ask people for money uh, people gave him money voluntarily they gave him even ended up willing him houses and stuff um so it, it's interesting because th there's this idea of an alternative righteousness that i've talked about before people say well you know i don't need i don't need god to be good because i'm a nice person and i'm kind and i'm generous and th this is the guy who puts food out for the skunks and coyotes at night that's how nice he was but none of that stuff matters if you don't have God because our righteousness is as filthy rags, as filthy menstrual rags, according to the Bible. So uh, this guy had the alternative righteousness, but he was absolutely base, you know, in terms of he was totally sexually depraved, just off the charts. And I've read about this guy, and uh, people say he didn't tell the truth. Well, every, everyone that's been asked about him that knew him says that everything he says is 100% true. And I think he's probably telling the truth. I have no reason to doubt it. Um, he was certainly right about Rock Hudson. So um, I, know, I read about this and um, thought about how Hollywood used to be. I and mean, it's it's like virtually everybody out there was was you know had something going on. I mean Vincent Price, 
Uh, this, this man said he had a threesome with Ava Gardner and Lana Turner. Um, uh, then there's, there's other stories, you know, Errol Flynn supposedly had a sexual relationship with Tyrone Power. So, uh, why am I telling you this? Well, it's not, first of all, it's not just the, the actors, it's everybody behind the camera. It's directors, obviously makeup artists and wardrobe people. I don't even have to tell you that, choreographers. Um, so it's just this huge industry that's full of perversion. I mean, it's almost like the prison culture, you know, prison, prisons are full of homosexuals because prisoners tend to be depraved people. And if you're depraved about one thing, you're likely to be depraved about everything else. So uh, if Hollywood was like that back then, well, of course it's still like that now. These are the people who sit around in meeting rooms d deciding what to put in our entertainment. They're the ones who approve the scripts, who write the scripts, who do the costumes, who, who do the filming. And it, it maybe it's not 100% of them, but, um, just about all of them approve of it if they're not actually in, engaged in it. So who do you think is is dictating to them? Where do you think that's coming? Do you think they're listening to the Holy Spirit? I mean, actually, sometimes they do. They do. Uh, like there was a movie called The Book of Eli, which was written by an atheist. And somehow it turned out to be full of stuff about Christianity, about Holy Spirit-led Christianity. The, the, the uh, writer could not po possibly have understood. But the general rule is this stuff comes straight from the from Satan's throne. And you should leave it alone because when you when you let this stuff flow through you, you're undoing all the good of prayer, prayer in tongues, reading the Bible, doing good works. You're you're inclining yourself towards Sodom, like Lot's wife. You know, your Lot's wife was walking towards Sodom, but she had to turn around and look. She couldn't give it up. So you know what happened to her. Um. So that's why I'm giving it up. I had this dream last night. I dreamed I was on my dad's boat. My dad had this at a 46 foot header shot, which was really nice. We used to fish on it. And sometimes I dream I'm on that boat. So last night I dreamed I was on a boat. He had a boat in the dream was a little bit smaller, a little bit different. And a bunch of my friends were on the boat having a good time. And we were somewhere near Miami beach in a canal. And for some reason the boat was at the edge of the canal, like up against the mangroves. It wasn't anchored. It was just sitting there. And I thought that was weird. And I noticed the boat was listing to port. So I thought maybe it was taking on water and I opened up a hatch and I looked down in the engine room and I saw water next to the engine. So I reached down in there, I actually kind of jumped down into the engine room next to the bilge pump and I found all this crud caught up in the bilge pump and I went in there and yanked it all out and put it in the wastebasket. And uh, then I found, I, I noticed that the, I also noticed that my dad who was up on the flybridge running the boat, he wasn't paying any attention and he had kicked a switch and the bilge pumps weren't on. So I had to turn on the bilge pumps and get the boat running and um, get it moving so it would go up on plane and the, the water in the boat would go back toward the back where it would be away from the, the engines and where it would be toward the, the, the aft bilge pumps where there's you know a lot of capacity. And uh, when I woke up, I was asking God, what is this about? What is this about? And, and, and it, it was about watching this garbage that comes from Hollywood, that comes from professional sports. Uh, a lot of Christians love professional sports. It's as evil as anything can possibly get. And if you can't see that, you really need to start praying in the spirit. You, it, it's wrong. I know people, oh, there's so many Christians in the NFL. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. There are Christians on stripper poles. Don't pay any attention. So, uh, I don't know. I, guess, I just wanted to tell you, if you want authority, you have to show that you're on God's team all the time. And if people want to cast out demons, and sometimes they try to cast them out, and the demons won't go. Well, why is that? It's because part of the time, they're they're fighting for the other side, and the demons look at them, and they go, I don't have to listen to that guy. He works for us, you know, he's he's a switch hitter. So uh, you really need to get this stuff out of your life and pray for God to fill your life with things that, that come from him. And that's what I'm doing now, that's what my wife is doing. And it's really helpful, I don't miss this stuff. So praying for other people, interceding for, for crooked, wicked people, helps me with love, helps me with faith, improves me. And turning away from this garbage that, that we pay Hollywood, to, that we pay them to pump sewage into our houses. But turning away from that has been really helpful. And I strongly recommend you do it too. And of course, this means music too. You know, give it up, give it up, give it up. Stay away from it. Get away from video games to stop getting tattoos. It's not legalism. You know, legalism is, is like a point system. It's like God has said, well, this is a game and you score this many points and you get to heaven. That's not what this is. It's it's just practical advice. Like if you do this, you're causing problems in your life. It's like telling someone to quit smoking so they don't get cancer. If I tell you not to smoke so you don't get cancer, that's not legalism. You understand? You should have enough maturity to understand it. It has nothing to do with legalism. You can't just do whatever you want You want if you're a Christian. God is not mocked according to his word. You know, for, for many years I thought, well, as long as I ask God for forgiveness, I'll be all right. You know, I'll say, well, I know I'm going to do this. So I'll say, God, will you please forgive me, and, and then I'll do it. <laughs> 
which is so stupid. So don't make the mistake I used to make. And there's a lot of people out there making that now. They say, say, once saved, always saved, which is absolutely not found anywhere in the Bible. The Bible says no one can take you out of God's hand, but it doesn't say you can't leave of your own will. So uh, that's it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Very long video. I hope this is helpful to you. I'll try to upload it tomorrow. And please, please give me your, your intercession request because what other purpose do I serve down here? Thanks.